that it make for the study of video games. Um, and I think that it's something that should be looked at. Okay, so a little bit about my history in this, uh, this issue. Um, I'm just starting out as a philosopher of the arts, and it seemed obvious to me that there was a lot to be written in the philosophy of the arts about the video game. Um, so I've written a book. It will be available in November. It's very reasonably, reasonably priced, um, so please buy it. It's got a nice cover. Uh, and it sets out some of the issues that I'm going to discuss here in, in a lot of depth, and I think it provides a pretty prov provocative and different view of video games. So, uh, the definition of video games. So what can philosophy contribute to the understanding of video games? Uh, I, I guess that everybody here, hopefully, thinks that philosophy does have something distinctive, uh, unique to con contribute to uh, video games. Um, so my answer to this question is, so I think there's a, um, a large body of theory within philosophy uh, that might be used, implemented, to talk about various things in video game. Um, a number of different sort of uh, theoretical areas. My own area, philosophy of the arts, I think, has a number of different theories that um, seem apt to discussing uh, facts about video games. So this is because, I guess, video games branch into the areas in which philosophy of the arts has had a traditional concern with things such as definition, representation, ethics, um, emotion, morality, all that sort of stuff. Uh, not just the analytic philosophy, of course. Um, there are other vari um, variations of philosophy that might make a contribution in this regard. So I've read a lot of papers recently um, discussing how phenomenology or Heidegger's ideas might be used to explain what's going on in video games. Um, I'm going to discuss some of this um, later in this uh, presentation. And of course, there's a, um, a great deal of theory in the book um, drawn from various areas. Second thing that philosophy can contribute to the, the theory of video games is method. I guess um, philosophers do have a method, even though we might sometimes really wonder what it is. Um, you know, I'm still trying to work it out myself, really, what my method is. Um, it's not a scientific method, of course, but there are a lot of things that we philosophers do, know how to do, practice, and have developed over a, a long period of time that have been useful in discussing various things and uh, making various ideas clear. One of the key methods that philosophers make use of is definition. Uh, analytic philosophers in particular often try to formulate definitions of items to um, provide some clarity or to uh, attempt to understand what's really going on uh, in some particular issue. And I think that this um, analytic method has the potential to add a lot of clarity um, to debates and game studies that are not always known for it. So this is the contentious part of this address. Uh, reading the game studies literature as an analytic philosopher can at times be a bewildering experience. Uh, I get the impression that some words that are used in a way that I've never experienced them or encountered them before. Uh, there are some persisting debates in, in game studies, such as the, the narratology ludology debate, um, which I'm just not sure you know, I'm, what it's really about. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced, in fact, that if game study theorists would actually be more careful and precise in defining what they mean by terms like game and narrative, that a lot of these debates would actually just dissolve overnight. It seems obvious to me that if we define narrative and game in a, in a relatively uh, clear way, you know, that it's, it's obvious that video games involve games and they involve narratives. But the, the, the consequence of that fact seems rather limited from a theoretical point of view. I'm going to discuss this um, shortly. It's, it's actually puzzling to me how that debate has persisted um, for such a long time. There are other debates that I think would uh, um, stand um, being analysed, such as the magic circle. What is the magic circle? I still don't know. I think um, a certain amount of analytical clarity about that idea would probably dissolve into nothing. Uh, I think it's a multi-stranded concept. It refers to a lot of things in a very imprecise way, and that we should prefer not to trade metaphors like that. I think substantive terms are better. There is, of course, some doubt, I think, in game studies that games can be defined. And we're going to encounter an instance of it, I suspect, very shortly. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, I've seen various other instances of, of this doubt over the uh, years that I've been working on this particular issue. Um, so how reasonable is it to think that video games might be defined? Uh, my entry into this debate was in a paper in Contemporary Aesthetics called The Definition of Video Games. 
in which I tried just to set out in a really clear way what I thought video games were. I thought there was some sort of instrumental utility to actually doing this, just to sort of stump up with a definition, um, to provoke people perhaps into responding. Um, no one has responded yet. You know, I'm still waiting on that. <laughs> was everybody convinced? Did anybody actually read that paper? I don't know. Um, it's pretty hard to tell sometimes. So how reasonable is it to actually define video games? Well, this depends upon what we think the function of definition actually is. And it's pretty clear from philosophy that uh, definitions have a lot of different functions. Uh, there are lots of uses that we can put them towards, and on the various functions that they have, uh, the reasonableness and the usefulness of definitions might actually come out quite differently. So I'm going to explain uh, maybe four theories of definition or four variations of what definition might be. I think on each of these, uh, we might think that, well, they might be reasonable but useless or incredibly use useful or and um, dubious or maybe just actually useful and quite reasonable. Uh, so, so there are, are, I think, at least two worries we have, might have with definition or an actual instance of the definition. So we want to define some sort of term, let's say species or gold or art or um, video games. And there seem maybe two kinds of uh, worries we might have with that instance. Uh, there are probably lots more, but these are two that I'm going to talk about today. So a history of failed definitions in an actual instance might lead us to suspect that there is something wrong with defining this term in the first place. So um, for those of you who aren't with us, who aren't, there's a very long, um, convoluted debate that's gone on about the definition of art and it's not clear that it's actually reached any sort of measure of consensus. It's been going on for a very, very long time, and people just don't agree. It strikes me um, that maybe there's something deeper going on here. Maybe there's some sort of theoretical problem. Of course, I'm not the first to actually think this. Uh, some of the, the, the theoretical doubts about video game, uh, sorry, the definition of art go back to the 1950s. But maybe um, for an actual instance of a definition, uh, if there is this long history of failed definition, definition of that item is wrong for some reason. Of course, this isn't a very logically convincing argument, is it? Um, it might be psychologically convincing because uh, just because the fact that a definition hasn't been found doesn't mean one might not be found. The second type of reason we might have uh, to doubt the reasonableness of a definitional instance is um, a theoretical reason. So we might have some sort of substantive uh, issue with the domain that's trying to be defined or the item that's trying to be defined that leads us to suspect that maybe we can't define this type of thing. It's not the type of thing that can actually be defined. So these are likely to be logically stronger arguments. And there are a number of these um, um, arguments provided again in the definition of art debate. So I'm going to talk about um, two other types of definitional debate here that we might um, reflect on uh, to you know, draw some lessons for the definition of video games. First is the definition of art debate, and I'm also going to talk about definitions of biological kinds such as species. So I think actually reflection on these things is quite important. So two different types of doubt. But for that first doubt, uh, this long history of failed definitions, well, it's too early to conclude that video, game, video games cannot be defined on the basis of the failure of previous definitions. Because there is no long history of uh, dis definitions and their reputations and counter definitions and so forth in video games. It's not a debate that's actually been had. Um, some might disagree with me here. Okay, it's clear that uh, definitions have not gone unnoticed in game studies. Um, a lot of central works, such as Salem, Zimmerman, uh, Espadule, they talk about definitions. But the unfortunate fact is that most of the definitions that are discussed in game studies are definitions of game simplicity, so just games, and not video games or not computer games. So if we look at Jules, or Jules list of definitions or Salem Zimmons list of definitions, um, they're in the majority about games. Jules calls his definition the classic game model. Okay, so it's couched to um, talk about games, not video games. Uh, this is sort of an unfortunate fact, I think. So there's not been any significant debate about the definition of video games or computer games. This is one thing that you might notice here. I'm using the term video games where I guess this conference is called the, the philosophy of computer games. Uh, I'm going to talk about the nominal variations that actually exist here and what their relevance is, what their um, consequence is. So there has been one. So 
So the theoretical reasonableness or usefulness of definitions of video games depends upon what we think of the nature and role of definition. So here I'm going to discuss a number of kinds of definition, as I said, and talk about their reasonableness and usefulness. I'm actually going to discuss their reasonableness more. Uh, I'll just say a few things about the usefulness of definitions. What can definitions actually provide us with? Well, they, they're a practical use. Um, they're a practical use personally because they force you, they confront you um, with the need to actually specify what you believe in a, in a really straightforward uh, way. So they're, they're also risky. Um, they give your theory the potential of being false. Okay? They, they stick up, you know, here's, here's what would, it, it would take to falsify me. Find a counterexample of this. I think that's a useful way to proceed. Um, they're also good for structuring arguments and structuring theory. So I think the, the role that definition really played in my own book was it provided me with a way of access into the material. So I defined video games, which I'm going to talk about, my own definition, and this allowed me to sort of push into video games um, by looking at the actual individual conditions and seeing how they combine in video games. So I think definition is actually something that's very useful to want to do. So here's the first conception of what a definition might be. So nominal definition. Uh, the definition of terms as they are used in everyday discussion or technical discussion. So um, the sorts of definitions you might find in a dictionary or the sorts of definitions that my first year students will say, you know, will bring up in the first sentence of their essay and, you know, annoy me with. <coughs> so nominal definitions um, are entirely eminently reasonable, aren't they? Uh, because um, if we're competent speakers of the language, we've probably got a pretty good idea about the nominal uh, content, the nominal nature of a definition. So they're eminently reasonable, um, but they're also sort of trivial uh, in terms of explanation. Uh, they're not much use. They're important, though, to consider because, as I know, there's a great deal of variation about how video games are referred to. There are a number of different terms, and they're not always synonymous. There's computer game, video game, electronic game, interactive entertainment, digital entertainment. You've probably encountered loads more than this. So what sorts of relations do these actually stand in? Are we talking about the same thing, or are there a number of overlapping extensions, or are we just really confused? Um, why do these terms vary? Why am I using the term video game rather than computer game? Well, I think that's just because it's the term that is used where I come from most often. Uh, computer games are used, of course, but I think they refer more to PC games. Um, video game is the generic term that dominates usage in New Zealand, and also, I think, America. I think that's fair to say. So um, these nominal variations are important to consider, um, but I'm not sure that they're really substantive enough to drive our theory in the way that I think definitions are, should be useful for. So here's a second conception of what definition might be. Um, essentialist definition, so sort of a classic Aristotelian sense almost, um, of definition comprised of necessary and sufficient conditions um, that explicate the essence of a, a defined term. So there's a long history of attempting to provide these definitions in philosophy, and I I guess um, this is, might be the first port of call for philosophers when they want to define a term. And this has been traditionally what um, philosophers of the arts have been after when they've been attempting to define art. Um, a list of conditions that are individually necessary and jointly sufficient to make something art. So the problem with that debate, of course, is that it's been extraordinarily hard to find this list of conditions that is necessary for art and also sufficient for art. Lots of different things have been um, proposed, such as aesthetic features, uh, representation, emotional expression, um, historical factors, you know, all sorts of things. <clears throat> Essentialist definition, um, you know, it works in a number of domains, I think. Uh, it's going to work anywhere. It's probably going to work in um, analytic terms, like bachelor, or um, some natural science terms like gold, where it does seem possible to explicate, you know, the actual essence of, of the term, such as an atomic weight in that case. I think, though, that essentialist definitions in the case of video games are likely to be problematic. Uh, there are reasons to think that they're not actually going to be successful. And I think that this is a lot of the, um, a lot of the explanation of why they're not about the ability to define um, video games or computer games. So I think essentialist uh, definitions of video games is contentious. And there are reasons to be suspicious of essentialism, necessary and sufficient condition definition uh, in the case of video games. What I want to do here is, is not really to argue that you can't come up with an essentialist definition of video games. In fact, later on I'm going to propose one. Uh, what I want to do is I just want to cover all the, um, the sorts of doubts we might have with this mode of definition. 
Um, because I'm going to claim that even if this is the case, and even if these definitions aren't available to us for some theoretical reason, this is no reason to forego the definitional process, because there are other functions the definition can take. So here is the first reason. I think that we might suspect essentialism in the case of video games, and that's because they're technologically and culturally contingent to an extraordinary degree. Um, I guess the, the impression is that if, we, if we're looking for an essentialist definition of something, um, the likely candidates are going to be those things for which there really are enduring essences, such as gold. Gold doesn't change, does it? Um, so in, in the case of video games, I think the fact that they are technologically contingent and this technology is continually changing, uh, it's developing rapidly, things that are possible now weren't even envisaged when the technology first came about. And they're also culturally contingent, so any particular video game depends upon a genre history, video games previously, and these things develop in um, unpredictable ways. Okay, because of all the contingency, it's not clear um, necessarily that we will find a set of conditions that all and only video games share, apart from some very basic ones that are also shared by related things. Uh, such as their media and their entertainment function. <clears throat> I'll discuss that shortly. So there's one reason to, to be suspicious of essentialist definition. The second reason, related, is that the vernacular concept might be unprincipled. It might simply be the case that uh, this term that we have, video game or computer game, is something that was formed accidentally. Um, it's just got a history of usage. It's expanded in non-principled ways to discuss this portion of things. And there hasn't been any real reflection about the usage of this term. Um, there hasn't been a sort of reflection, for instance, that as there has been in natural science, where obviously there's a lot of reflection on picking out natural kinds and so forth. Um, video game has been essential. By the nominal variations that I mentioned previously, it's obvious that there are nominal variations, and they, there are variations because of things like geography or whatever, okay? Things that aren't, don't really seem theoretically pertinent. And finally, um, it's not clear that there actually is agreement on the category's extension. It's not clear that we ag agree what things sit within the class of video games. Uh, there are, you know, contentious cases. Um, is Second Life a video game? Um, some, I, you know, I've heard people um, say it is. I've heard people disagree that it is. Uh, what about Toriyamaki, which is a um, uh, downloadable game for the PlayStation um, 3? You get it from the PS Network, and it involves sort of Japanese stock artworks that uh, in conjunction with the eye tour you can sort of manipulate in, in sort of fancy graphical ways. Um, is it a video game or is it just some sort of interactive vis visualization? And, and whose intuition really counts here? You know, who gets to determine the extension of what a video game is and what a video game isn't? So these are three reasons that combined, I think, even though they're not knocked down sort of logical reasons, why might, we might suspect that essentialism uh, might not be a useful task uh, in uh, to pursue in the case of video games. I'm going to re return to these later. <clears throat> but defining video games might be reasonable even if essentialism in the form of necessary and sufficient condition definitions is not. Because this kind of essentialist definition doesn't source the resources that definition has. There are additional things that we might think the definition could be, different ways that it could work, that uh, don't strictly align with essentialism. So I'm going to discuss some of those and um, talk about how we might use those forms to define video games and to avoid those problems with essentialism. So um, the first instance is disjunctive definition. So a disjunctive de definition is a definition with at least a, a one clause that uh, comes in the form of a disjunctive statement, either or. So um, it's, it claims that um, X is... Um, something, uh, if and only if it has such conditions, but um, one of those clauses um, has an, an or in it. So um, I guess uh, these have been proposed, these theories have been proposed in the case of art. And Steve argued that art might be under. <coughs>
explicate conceptually essential definitions. Okay, they just turn on a, a minor point of logic, logic. And they're actually um, good to have around, I think. Uh, and they're motivated in a number of cases. Um, they might be motivated in the case of art. Maybe uh, there just is uh, more than one way for something to be an artwork. And correspondingly, maybe there just is more than one way for something to be a video game. <clears throat> this chunk of definitions, I think, are, are useful for capturing non-monolithic categories because they are less like or extensional. Okay. What they do is they they list conditions in a not necessarily principled way. Okay, this is actually both their strength and their weakness. If you're going to claim that video games can't be defined, then you need to argue against this um, version of definition because actually um, it's pretty easy to find a disjunctive definition of almost anything because if you find a, a case in the extension that doesn't fit, you just add on another disjunct and you can keep on going <coughs> and eventually you'll capture it. Okay. <coughs> uh, of course, if we do that, uh, then we might think that we're just unprincipledly expanding um, the list of conditions to suit future cases, and, and obviously that's uh, become a sort of a trivial post hoc way of defining something. But if you claim that video games can't be defined, you know, uh, it seems to be a problematic issue. <clears throat> but um, I think these cases are useful because there are some categories which we suspect are non-monolithic. They don't all make a, a unity, uh, but they're useful to have around nevertheless. So an example might come from emotion theory. Um, there's a philosopher of, the, uh, of a philosopher of science called Griffiths, and he argues that emotions don't form a natural kind, but in fact they, they uh, constitute at least three different things. Uh, there are affect programs, um, higher cognitive emotions, and uh, these sorts of culturally conditioned behaviours. Um, these things aren't all the same kind, but they have this sort of similarity which has led to us terming them to be emotions. Um, he argues that uh, they're not a natural kind and we should, add, in fact, um, separate them out into different categories. But uh, a lot of emotion theorists, some emotion theorists, have responded to this by saying that, well, um, it's unlikely that you're going to get rid of this concept of the emotion because it's so central to how we explain other people's behavior. So, for example, um, uh, Damasio, Antonio Damasio, claims that, well, even if it is the case that the emotions are diverse in kind, they don't actually form a, a natural kind, a single thing, uh, we should prefer to have this term emotion around just because of the central role it plays in explaining behavior. So if we want to define emotion, maybe we, we do have to use this dis disjunctive uh, way of defining emotion. Maybe that's the case in video games as well. Uh, maybe it is the case that video games don't form a, um, a single category that we can unite in a principled way by an essentialist definition to want to define that non-monolithic category. Because if you want to explain video games with scare quotes, okay, just the things that are referred to by that term, well, maybe it's motivated to do, in a, do so in a disjunctive way. Okay, so here is what I did. This is my definition of video games, uh, one of them. If and only if is an artifact in a visual digital medium, is intended as an object of entertainment, and is intended to provide such entertainment through the employment of one or both of the following modes of engagement, rule and objective gameplay or interactive fiction. So in this definition, there are um, a number of uh, necessary features, uh, the visual digital medium condition and the uh, entertainment condition. Note that uh, there's some intended stuff going on there to um, uh, avoid certain counterexamples. And um, then there is a disjunct, um, a disjunctive clause that explains how video games have traditionally provided a means of entertainment in visual digital and I claim that those uh, uh, conditions are rule and objective gameplay, which is an explicitive sense of gaming that I'm going to refer to shortly, and interactive fiction, uh, which I also um, do a lot of explaining. So, you know, it's not like these terms um, are just hanging loose here. The reason for this, which I, I don't really want to revisit because that would be um, re-engaging in the paper, um, but the, one of the basic reasons is that I suspect that there are two sorts of for video games uh, in terms of their modes of engagement and their forms. Um, one is rule, rule and objective video, um, sorry, gaming. And this is clear in transmedial games um, such as chess or you know, games that have migrated into a visual digital media from um, non-video game forms. There are lots of those. But there is also this other precedent, I think, that clearly exists for video games, and that's simulations. Things without objectives or rigid rules, um, but rather that allow you to engage in a fictional world in a sort of an 
an imaginary way and to do something there. Okay, maybe even not with um, uh, a considered outcome that you're aiming at. <clears throat> so that, that's the disjunctive definition. Um, it claims that there are um, two ways that you can be a video game. But it's important that um, the definition is only useful here, I think, for counting out certain problematic cases. In almost all cases of video games, I think, you have both games and fiction. And that if I wanted to provide a theory of um, uh, video games, the substantive one that explains what was going on in most cases, I would just say that these two conditions are combined. So in um, you know, uh, several cases of video games like Grand Theft Auto or Microsoft Flight Simulator, or maybe not, or um, you know, just pick a game, pull like three. <clears throat> you have both games, sort of rule and objective gameplay, uh, where you want to get some end, a defined end that uh, uh, you don't create. And also you have the simulated reality or this fictional world that you're involved in. Um, so I think both of these conditions are actually combined in almost all video games. And that once we've got this out of the way, this definitional um, issue, that we can go on and discuss how those two things are combined in most video games. But we do need the definition to count out certain problematic cases, I think. Okay, so that's this jump to definition. Um, but that doesn't uh, exhaust um, the types of definition that we might form. Um, there is another use of definition, and it is an explication. So picking out a concept that might not actually exist, um, but is a, a refinement or reformulation of a concept. So uh, this is from Carnac's work on um, um, modal logic, I think. So the task of making exact, a vague, or not exact concept in everyday life or in an earlier stage of logical and scientific development, or rather replacing it by a newly constructed, more exact concept, belongs among the most important tasks of logical analysis and logical construction. So he's talking about things like ordered pairs and the con conditional and uh, some of the logical functions in this particular work. But I think that his ideas actually transfer quite nicely into the domain that we're looking at. So it's, an early, day, it's early days in the study of video games and computer games. And I think that um, this idea of explication, forming a new concept perhaps, um, that doesn't necessarily align with traditional vernacular terms, it's like video game or computer game, might be a useful thing to carry out. <clears throat> um, and this is quite a substantively different conception of how definition might function. Because it also, like, like this jump to definitions, seems to avoid or is um, useful in avoiding some of the problems of dog essentialist definitions. Um, particularly that one about agreement on an extension. Okay, so I'm going to argue that explicative definitions actually um, don't have that problem because they're, uh, you know, formulating them actually involves setting out an extension. <coughs> There's a spelling mistake. Explicative definitions may revise the intention of extensions of concepts of categories to capture an explanatorily useful term. So disjunctive definitions differ to essentialist ones by claiming that, well, maybe the form of the definition um, can be uh, sort of around with. We don't have to have necessary conditions, we can have sort of optional conditions. Um, explicative definition differs to essentialist definition by claiming that, well, maybe it's uh, the difference, the problem with essentialist terms is the terms that we're actually trying to define in the first place. And maybe the vernacular terms that we have that we've discovered through nominal usage just aren't the ones that we should be aiming at. And of course, explicative definition plays an important role in the sciences and all sorts of um, uh, areas of knowledge. <coughs> And here is an immediate use for explication here. So an example that we might have of um, a concept that should be explicated uh, in a useful way is the term game. So if anything becomes evident um, by reading game studies literature, it is the diversity in the way this term is actually used. Um, so if you go back to Heisinger and read that book, the thing that really impressed me about that book was how absolutely ubiquitous gaming and play actually is. And, and I think there is good reason for that. Um, uh, you know, those sorts of reasons, to think that you can't define games. At least you can't define um, game as it is used in a vernacular sense or as it might be used. So play and gaming seem so ubiquitous, they don't think, seem like a theoretically motivated grouping. Also, um, play, associated to gaming, seems to be an attitude that we might take to any number of different artifacts. So you might play with your mashed potatoes or you might play with um, annoying narratologists or you might play in all sorts of different senses. And it's not clear that um, you can actually define that attitude because it might attend um, to any number of different things. But this doesn't mean that we can't then go on and define games because we can do so in an explicative way. We can pick out um, 
an actual uh, um, extension uh, by actually formulating the definition. And this category need not cleave along the same lines as our vector understanding. So um, we might say, and I have, that we can, we can come up with a conception of rule and objective gameplay, or rule and objective games, of which a typical form is chess, and it's clear that there are exemplars, there are instances of rule and objective games, but it's not clear now that um, this explicated definition of rule and objective gameplay is prone to the same problems that essentialist definitions are. Because um, the role of counterexamples is actually quite different. Now you might come up with a, a counterexample of a game that doesn't have rules or that doesn't have objectives, but I can simply say, well, you know, this was an explicated definition to actually account for the games that do. This, this definition of games can actually be used to reflect on those non-standard cases. If you define an extension, of course, you define its complement, and now you can have a, a good idea, perhaps, about what's going on and, and the ways that um, some games depart from this uh, explicated category. So I think that that, um, that process of explication might be usefully carried out in game, game, you know, the, the term game, and this would be a useful thing to do. I also think that um, video games might actually be given an explication, um, an explicative de definition that avoids some of the problems that essentialism has about video games or actually provides another option, um, puts another option of a, of a definition on the table uh, that might be of theoretical use. So what, are we, what really um, justifies an explicative definition? Well, it seems to be the sort of pragmatic explanatory use that that defined category has in some project that we have. So um, explicative definitions, of course, have been um, used a lot in biology. Uh, we might want to explicate the sense of uh, species in some sort of interesting term. And a lot of the work that's been done on species terms um, by people like Richard Boyd and Ian Hacking, and these people, is to try and explicate the sense of, the of species, which is actually interesting in some sort of natural, you know, natural kind sense. Um, but uh, it's also clear that these explicated theories of what species are um, are just sort of stipulated in a way, okay? And they're not designed to go into certain areas. So if we take them too seriously and we try, you know, um, we try to be essentialist about these stipulated definitions of species, then we're going to come up to all sorts of um, bizarre conditions in which um, uh, we have to conclude that an Australopithecus at some stage had to rise to a, a kind of, you know, those sorts of problems. Um, in biology, uh, species is not a sort of concept that um, comes along um, temporal lines. And those sorts of ways. Okay, but it's um, useful because it allows us to see certain things. So I think that um, video games might be given such a definition, but to see this, uh, I need to quickly revisit my destructive definition. So um, this idea was sort of um, bothering me, hanging out the back of my head while I was writing out the uh, formulating the destructive definition, because I thought, well, here's a way to actually the disjunction in that definition, and that's to combine those two. Um, uh, uh, those two conditions, uh, rule and objective gameplay and interactive fiction in some overarching way. So some um, concept that um, combines them both okay, and allows us to form an essentialist definition. So I'm going to raise the possibility um, that the disjunctive clause of my definition can be united by employing Dominic Floper's um, notion of strong interaction. So Lopez has this idea uh, about computer art that some art is interactive in a way that previous art isn't because it, it um, employs the, um, the um, robust contingent nature of um, how computers work. And uh, it allows um, interpreters or interactors to actually have an effect on the um, item that is rendered. Okay, so the, he, he's talking about things like virtual instruments or um, perhaps hypertexts. So, um, it, it might be the case, actually, that this notion of strong interaction, which I'm going to discuss here, uh, allows us to explain what it is that rule and objective gameplay and interactive fiction actually share. And unite those two um, ideas into a single condition that we can now base uh, an essentialist definition of video games on. So here's a quote from his, his paper. The paper's called The Ontology of Interactive Art. So games are strongly interactive because their users' inputs help determine the subsequent state of play, whereas in weakly interactive media, the user's input determines which structure is accessed or the sequence in which it is accessed, 
In strongly interactive media, we may say that the structure itself is shaped in part by the interactive choices. The strongly interactive works are those who, whose structural properties are partly determined by the interactor's actions. And this distinction between weak and strong interaction is meant to distinguish between um, artworks in which you might just jumble up the order of the artwork. So putting a CD player, a CD in the player, and then just pushing uh, random, okay, you, you jumble up a Mahler symphony or something like that. Okay, that's obviously not a case of strong interaction because you're just experiencing the parts of that symphony in a different order. Uh, but some computer art actually allows you to have a, an impact on the, the state that is rendered. Um, and I think this applies to video games. So what's interesting about um, a game like Fallout 3 is that uh, the states, the representational states, aren't rendered in advance. Rather, um, the, the software program, the game, provides you with this contingent structure through which, by your actions, you can draw out all sorts of different planes. Uh, you're able to design your character, uh, give it a name, um, you know, pursue all sorts of um, immoral actions, um, kill everybody as I do, uh, uh, collect teddy bears, um, you know, shoot gnomes at people, all this sort of stuff. Uh, these are only possibilities in the, in the representational problem of Fallout 3. And they seem to show that Fallout 3 is strongly interactive. Lopez has a, a new book just out, The um, Philosophy of Computer Art, I think. It's called All in a Check on Video Games, in which he um, argues, I think, although I haven't read it yet, I've heard the outline, that uh, video games might stand under computer art as popular, um, popular end of the spectrum. Um, so Grand Theft Auto might stand to. Uh, um, the computer art that he's talking about as, uh, I don't know, Die Hard stands to um, a good movie. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> games and interactive fiction may be both cases of strong interaction, which may leave us with a necessary and sufficient condition definition. So we can now formulate the definition thusly. X is a video game, if and only if it is an artifact in a visual digital medium, is intended as an object of entertainment, and is strongly interactive. And surely we should uh, prefer this over my disjunctive definition because, well, just as issues of parsimony. Whereas my definition was complicated by this disjunctive clause, either or, we've now got this essentialist definition of what video games might be. And um, so in this presentation, you've got you know, two definitions for the price of one. Which, which is the one to go for? Or maybe they're both some fundamentally flawed. We can discuss that. Okay, but this is a, um, a way we might define video games. But remember the point of me going through this um, notion of definition was actually to show that um, explicative, explicative definitions of video games might be possible. Um, and I think that's shown by certain problems that this definition is going to have with accounting for video games. I don't think, uh, I think there's at least some reason to think that this video game definition doesn't work. And I'm going to discuss those here. Okay, um, I've, I've thought through these and maybe you'll be able to come out with some examples yourself um, and I really have to play some of these games again and have a good think about them. Um, but unfortunately, strong interaction may not be sufficient for video games. It may not be the case that everything in a digital medium and it's formulated to um, uh, be a work of entertainment or to have in uh, entertaining ends. Actually, so examples of these would be the sorts of applications you find on the Nintendo DSi. Uh, um, so the DSi is a uh, little handheld that allows you to manipulate um, real-time video, uh, music, and so forth and in, strongly, in, in ways that seem strongly interactive. So what you're doing is you, you, um, you can manipulate pictures of people to give them big stupid smiles or whatever. Okay, here you're actually um, having an impact on what is rendered, but it doesn't seem like these things are video games, are they? They seem like applications. Um, at least if we're agreed about extension. Okay, that problem's going to um, become obvious here again because, well, maybe they are. But um, I think there is at least uh, some reason to think these aren't video games. Another case might be interactive visualizations, such as Tori Maki, which I um, uh, referred to earlier, or some tech demos. So you might have seen Project Natal, Microsoft's new um, uh, control peripheral, and one of the tech demos for that was this thing called Paint Party. And one of the demo for that was these people painting an elephant. Okay? Is that a game or is it just a, uh, an application that allows you to, you know, fool around and have fun? <clears throat> it's not clear to me that they genuinely are games. And maybe there's something really different about those things and fully-fledged games. Maybe have to be formal structures. 
Okay, so uh, strong interaction doesn't seem to be sufficient, along with um, digital visual media and entertainment, for something to be a video game. And unfortunately, it might not even be necessary. Okay, there might be examples of our, um, video games which aren't strongly interactive in the sense. Um, in which really you're not contributing to the game state or allow, make decisions that has an impact on the way it's rendered, but you're just exploring a pre-rendered world. And maybe you've got examples of this. My suspicion is that some early text-based games of progression, you also are just um, uh, weekly interactive fictional worlds that you explore and you, you know, playing the game is actually just traversing um, a unique path through a pre-rendered representational item. Mist also strikes me. This is the game I've got to replay um, to see if this actually is the case. Uh, whether it's just actually the exploration of um, predefined, pre-rendered states, screens, or whether actually you do have an impact on the game state. You might be able to think of some of these, uh, some examples yourself in which video games don't have strong interaction. So this might leave us uh, with a question, why video games aren't necessarily strongly interactive? It seems to me that strong interaction is, is really what's interesting about video games. Uh, and strongly interactive video games like Fallout 3 you know, are a great, a great deal of fun because they're contingent and unpredictable and you can do all sorts of crazy things. Like um, you know, use the gravity system to set off lots of mines next to a person and watch them going flying off into the air. There's a lot of fun to do. Okay. <clears throat> but maybe it's not that video games are all strongly interactive because uh, video games designers aren't interested in principles. They're, they'll do anything. They'll design an artifact using a computer uh, in any way they want that allow them to sort of tease some um, uh, entertainment value out of the computer. So there are just too many ways to skin a cat and not all of them are strongly interactive. Um, that might be why um, strong interaction isn't necessarily sufficient along with those other conditions for something to be a video game. But here's the point. Um, this does leave us with the possibility of a new explanatory class of strongly interactive entertainments. Uh, this class isn't identical with video games because it leaves out some video games, uh, things like Myth perhaps, or those games of progression which are just traversing this pre-rendered uh, representational item. And it may include some things that we're not tempted to think of as video games, such as strongly interactive visualizations like Tori Markey or some of those applications that you find on um, DSi or Paint Party. Okay, this is a new explicated term then. Um, and it might be of genuine interest. And it will clearly... Um, bind together, I think, uh, rule and objective gameplay in most cases and uh, interactive fiction because it does seem like those two things um, share this paradigm sense of strong interaction. Okay, it was the, um, the, the similarity between games and computer art that actually um, caused Lopez to um, formulate that idea of strong interaction. So maybe this is a genuinely interesting explicative concept that we might um, look into. Okay, so here are the conclusions. <clears throat> Definition has the analytic resources to meet problems with essentialism. So, you know, even if we think that essentialism is a bizarre tack to take in, in the case of video games, just because they're too culturally or technologically contingent, um, this doesn't mean that we should have no interest in defining video games. We can go about forming an explicative class or just building the contingency. Um, and given uh, the usefulness of definitions and clarifying issues, staking out risky positions, showing what it is for you to be wrong, then there's definitely um, some worth in wanting to define video games. But it might not be the case that um, it's the definition of video game that we're after, but definitions of video games or definitions of computer games, explanatorily useful, uh, explicated concepts that allow us some sort of purchase on what we're talking about, so some sort of access. <clears throat> And um, I guess this is a, um, a contribution, an important contribution that um, philosophy could make to the discussion of video games. So I'll end there, but just before I end, I'd like to thank uh, the program committee, the organizing committee for um, organizing the conference and inviting me, and also the Nordic Games Research Network um, for assisting me uh, in getting here. Thank you. <coughs>
Well, yeah, I understand those cases. Um, and I, but, you know, um, of course that's a reason why we might prefer using computer games if we want to talk about those cases of um, musical games or whatever. But uh, is that the real concept now? Because what you've done is you've just changed the extension to include something else. So I'm not sure what that... Yeah. Yeah, well, my own interest here is in video games. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not into game studies. I'm not a game studies scholar. And actually, I've got a sort of a very narrow interest in video games, and it's into those sort of artful, representationally robust games that actually sort of fit within philosophy of the arts. My theories here aren't um, meant to be some sort of uh, last word on, on these issues. I'm, you know, in, in the book, I'm, I'm mostly interested in exploring um, video games as art. And I think um, video games is a nice concept to use for that. Um. So when the, the interactive choice is actually determined, the structure that is rendered. Okay. So well, well, I, I lost the, word there. the structure that is rendered. So the structure that is rendered. Rendered. Rendered? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, but I should add that you've also got to determine what the structure is. So in the case of um, okay. uh, the, an interactive artwork, it'll be the aesthetic properties that the... Um, the structure has, or in a, um, a computer game, it'll be whatever we think the important structures are there. Yeah. 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 So this is, a, yeah, this that needs more explanation in that um, case, and I've, yeah, I've got that. Yes, I'm assuming that video games are real things in the world. And that, um, you know, when we're trying to define them, we're coming up with some sort of uh, way of classifying and categorizing them that makes some sort of sense, you know, and is principled and is uh, useful in an explanatory way. Okay, yeah. Um, if that answers your question. Yes. Okay, great. I have a question actually that's something you've written, uh, written about. You mentioned. It sort of sounds like a different type of thing you might be talking about. But, well, just In a sentence. Yeah, I guess I do mention it there. I think yeah, I just, I just was wondering, I was just wondering, also works do seem to, lots of work, we have theatrical works, allow for a number of structurally different renderings. Yeah. Um, not maybe as different as Fallout 3 does. So I was just wondering if you could just say maybe a few sentences about just what you're thinking. Yeah. Well, just to sort of uh, illustrate what we're talking about here, because this definition obviously will have an impact on game ontology and uh, criticism and uh, all that sort of stuff. And my own view is, I haven't, I haven't really thought this through a whole lot, I've, I've written a paper about it, is I suspect that um, um, uh, video games might be work generators um, uh, in a sense. And that, uh, okay, so we're wondering uh, what's the work in, in, in Fallout 3? Is it, um, you know, we, we want to understand what we're evaluating. Um, it's, uh, Fallout 3 is unlike other artworks because um, there isn't a, you know, a, a similar um, thing produced every time the game is played. 
So in, in the case of Marla 5, you can expect to hear various stuff and you'll be able to identify what's going on. It's quite structurally you know, consistent, although there are going to be differences in uh, tempo and, and all that sort of stuff. But in Fallout 3, um, planes are going to be incredibly diverse. But they all count as the same word, don't they? So what, what is that relationship going to be? My own temptation is to think that um, the work of Fallout 3 is um, actually an instance generator. Uh, but then that, that brings up the question of what sort of um, interaction is it that actually renders um, the instance? Um, I guess what you're getting at is whether it's a performance of a sort of an algorithmic script or, or you know, a playing or um, whatever. Uh, do I really want to? Okay. Yep. Yep. Well, I guess that would be the intended as an object of entertainment. I've um, encountered it being argued that Second Life isn't a video game just because it doesn't have that um, direct intention to be an entertaining thing. Rather, it's got a, a, a lot of different uses. Um, my own opinion is that Second Life is a, um, it's quite evidently a, a video game. Um, and the reason why it's not thought of as a video game is um, mostly to do with marketing or people's conception of it as the serious thing. Uh, that's, that's my own opinion well, about that. A yeah, a I, I a see. 3D yeah. rendering of, of uh, the universe. Yeah. Sorry? A 3D, uh, completely interactive 3D environment that models the universe. Yeah. You yeah. can walk in and so it's not intended to just say one thing, but yep. I might be entertained by the Okay. So, you know, that condition is needed. The entertainment condition is needed to um, distinguish between these sorts of cases, actually. And there are clear cases in which um, it's not a video game because actually it's used for instruction. So imagine a sort of a, a medical simulator that allows you to simulate laparoscopic techniques. Maybe it's not meant to be entertaining, but incidentally it might be. Okay. So that's where the intended comes in as well. I think it's, you know, this is um, building a lot. This is a difficult issue, but I think you sort of do need this to count between those, those cases. Yeah, I, I can see, yeah, you might have problems with uh, intentionality full stop and, and you know, building those into a definition, but I'm not so sure that I do because I'm I think that intentions are important to work out what items are often. Um, I'm, not, I'm not so sure it's, it's, it's you know, so yeah. bogus to talk about. Yeah, it's, it's not, pri not a primary condition. It's, uh, so any, any entertaining part of it that you could use in the yeah, yeah. And, and uh, often, um, you know, those sorts of cases are, depend on their uh, ability to entertain to actually engage people. But you can imagine also items that don't have an entertainment function and, you know, I would not count those as video games. So maths games, for example, um, they're ways to trick kids into doing maths. And they are because they're, you know, video games. Um, does, does that change the, uh, the, the purpose of its creation? That would just be the, you know, using it, uh, the difference in use. You know, and this comes back to that issue. Yeah, I understand the, these problems. That comes back to that difficulty with you can treat almost anything as a game. You can try to tease some sort of entertainment um, uh, content out of it. Yeah. And that, um, that might be a problem that you should look into in this particular definition. Yeah. Yeah, that's no, Um, looking at the um, perspective on its use. Uh, I think 
you have to bring in the data to, to make uh, the significance and all that stuff? Yep. No, I, I don't think it's going to be a good move. It's just going <laughs> to, mm -hmm. things can be used in all sorts of ways. Yeah. I can beat you to death with a PlayStation 3. <laughs> Not that I intend to. For defining what something is, I think the intention with which it's created. Um, I think that's the way we treat artifacts, isn't it? But literature does give us a lot of uh, strong or great like Well, in some theories of literature, yes. Yeah. 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 But in others, um, the, the role of uh, intentions is actually still you know, held to be quite important. Can you, can you describe what it would be like? <laughs> yeah, this is, yeah, this is a, a valid, you know, um, video games aren't, well, I guess there are that sort of reflexive, serious side coming out now, isn't there? And there are also video art um, installations. And I've seen a lot of this stuff. And actually, uh, it's never as good as a video game. <laughs> Most of it's actually quite uninteresting, um, in, my, in my opinion. But, um, yeah, I don't know. You have to provide an example. So to address your, there's sort of two questions here. <laughs> well, to address the first issue, of course, you have to come up with um, some conception of authorship in video games. It's likely to be some sort of collective. And it's going to depend on, on what you're actually looking at. So if you're considering video game design, then you actually have to say who's responsible for designing these particular features into the, um, into the, the artwork. Um, have I forgotten your next bit? Um, Yeah, but yeah, that's um, also something that um, is, is required. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, and uh, is the player an artist um, in, in this case? Well, uh, that again touches back on this idea of performance. Um, is it the case that we actually do aesthetically um, judge what players are doing when they're playing video games? And I don't think we do, do we? We don't talk about elegant playings of Fallout 3 or, you know, it's, it's not clear to me that um, we actually do that. Um, although, you know, we can uh, come up with normative judgments about some aspects of games, such as in competitive gameplay. So we can think that this guy's really good and, you know, he's, um, he's quite skillfully dispatching his enemies. But I'm not sure we actually think about um, playings in aesthetic terms, um, in, in terms of the player. Although we might say, you know, I got into the situation, it was just this amazing sort of um, uh, sequence of events. Yeah. What about screenshots? And that, that might be one reason to think that um, uh, video games are sort of performance art. Is a lot of them do actually sort of engage you in an aesthetic way, like Oblivion. Um, it's got places you can climb into the mountains just for the purpose of actually getting a nice view. You know, just wander up there and have a look around. Yeah. Mm. Well, now there will be a 10-minute break. We'll be back here at 10.40. <coughs>